Hello again, and thank you for joining us for the first program in the Camden Garden Club's Winter Horticulture Series. We're going to be hearing from Stacy Kiefer today about photography, and I am going to now turn the program over to the president of the Camden Garden Club, Deborah Stokes. Deborah, take it away. Thank you, Julia. Yes, we really had hoped we were going to have this in person this year, but so it goes. So good morning, everyone. As president of the Camden Garden Club, I welcome you to the first presentation of our 2022 Winter Horticultural Series. There are a lot of club members watching today, but for you who do not really know about the Camden Garden Club, we are now in our 107th year as a nonprofit organization in support of the town of Camden. To give you a little insight into the club, our goals are to promote and encourage gardening, as you would expect, uh, to support civic improvements, education, and the conservation of natural resources in our communities locally and globally. So just a couple of examples of the efforts that you see around town are the hanging baskets in the summer with the geraniums hanging off the lampposts and the holiday wreaths that hang during the holiday season. We also provide the flowers and boxes and traffic islands you see around town but we are also very proud of the fact that we provide scholarships to local high school graduates who plan to major in one of the natural sciences. And of course, our big event is the annual garden tour held the third Thursday of every July. And we really hope to see you there this summer because we're it's looking like it's gonna be a really great tour. You can find more information about the club at camdengardenclub.org. Now, as Julia mentioned, the Winter Horticultural Series continues for the next four Tuesdays until the end of February. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Stacy Kiefer. Interestingly, Stacy does not have a television or a couch. Instead, she finds relaxing entertainment in the natural world around her in all seasons. So today she will share some favorite images, a few tips of capturing those unique subjects and special moments. So without further ado, I turn things over to Stacy. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Julia. And I am disappointed as well that we're not in the beautiful Camden Library, uh, but on a gray, snowy January day, I'm excited to be able to share my photos and go through the seasons uh, in Maine with you. I, I currently live in Union. But, uh, mo and most of these photos will be in the Union, Camden, Rockport, Midcoast area. However, um, I'll take you a few other places, Vermont and Newfoundland as well, just to uh, feel like you got to travel a bit today. So what I want to say first is that um, I am not a professional photographer. I am very amateur. Uh, I have many of the tools that you have and you'll see about 90% of my photography other than most bird photos, I've taken with a simple Android phone that many of you may also have. Picture of an Oriole that I captured with a real camera. So you know that I've brought your expectations up a little bit at this point. Um, and I do have oops, other Oriole photos as well. Um, they are one of my favorite birds that I'm fortunate to have nesting around my garden area. So a little bit about my photography. Most of my photography, as I said, I do with a phone and usually I am outside with my dogs when I'm doing that photography. And it's challenging because uh, this is an example of a, a blueberry field where I was lying on the ground taking a picture of this ice reflection in a puddle and I paused to look up above me and there are the dogs up on a boulder uh, probably looking at crows or something else going on and you'll notice um, I'll, I'll comment on a few of the photos uh, you'll notice that my focal point in my pictures is often in the right hand corner because I'm hanging on to two dog leashes in my left hand and I'm photographing my subject with my right hand. So we're gonna walk through some seasons today um, and uh, seeds are definitely one of my themes in my photography. 
and milkweed is definitely a favorite. Winter is currently my favorite season, believe it or not. I spend a lot of time outside in winter, uh, enjoying various winter sports and also walking the dogs. And I'm sorry, many of you probably only wanted to see pretty colorful flowers and um, birds today, but uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a different appreciation for winter and what ice and frost can do to our beautiful world. Of course, springtime, we'll go through spring photos. And summer. And what's interesting is not only uh, frost makes botanicals and bugs pretty, but so does water. And I, I do like to go out on foggy or dewy mornings and take a lot of photos. And some of you may cringe at Japanese beetles imagining them you know, destroying your green beans or roses or whatnot. But just with that little bit of water on it, I find the beetle rather beautiful. So now I said we were gonna travel to Newfoundland. I'm pretending we're starting off in the year in September. And it's one of my favorite places to visit at that time of year. And the provincial plant of Newfoundland is the pitcher plant. Um, there is a little ant on the, the plant to the left. Um, which uh, is how the plant feeds. And on the right are the flowers of the pitcher plant. I love them because they, they grow in bogs and I've seen them in bogs around here in Maine, but they also grow in Newfoundland in these high alpine zones right out of the rock, really. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so they, they make that uh, sort of barren alpine landscape more colorful. Some more. So this is an example of I mentioned with my dogs and photography, my focal point is often to the right. Um, I like to do a lot of macro or close up photography. So you'll see I'm sure I'm hanging on to a dog leash here. This is our, our dog walk when we got off the ferry in Newfoundland and uh, taking a, a little sunrise walk. This is probably the most unique plant that I'll share today. This is called a Baron's Willow. And this is uh, native only to one part of the world, and it's on the northern peninsula of Newfoundland. This is how it looks in the fall, and it gets that silky look of the seeds that I love so much. It captures the light. So here is an example of a photo that I took in Newfoundland, uh, probably in 2017, and I didn't give it much thought and later on I was going um, to print it for a little gift for my mom and I didn't even know at the time that the spider down in the lower left portion of the screen uh, and I gave you a little inset there was in the photo. Uh, and that's what I love about my photos is going back through them because all this macro photography and looking at the natural world so closely I find little critters and bugs that I didn't know were there when I was taking the photo. This Stacey, is just- Stacey, excuse me. We had uh, uh, Mary, one of our viewers wanted to know, you're using the term macro. Is that referring to a setting on the phone? Uh, it can be. Um, some phones may have them and some may not. Uh, otherwise, I take photos also at a very high resolution and I can crop them down later um, and they still retain some detail. And therefore you get a little bit closer up view of whatever subject you, you may be photographing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So Newfoundland's nickname is the rock and the rock formations there are incredible, but it also provides for very beautiful um, vegetation as well. I do a little bit of wildlife photography. It's more difficult and challenging, um, but I do what I can. Uh, here's some fox that were on, above a cliff on the northern part of Newfoundland. And light is so important to me. Uh, these are on some of the sand beaches on the south coast of Newfoundland. And I just, it's very windy there as well. And Without this light, you wouldn't see the plant tracks in, in the sand. 
Um, so light is very important for enhancing a photo. This is um, a bird called a yellow lace. Just loved, this one does not have much light, but it's just a very soft reflection before sunrise. And sandpipers are fun to photograph. I think, as I said, I'm very amateur. I probably took 300 sandpiper photos on a recent trip there, and um, probably a third to half of them were blurry. They move very fast. Bird photography is very challenging. And then there's some ocean vegetation for you, colorful. So back home, um, we have uh, seeds and um, I love seeds. This is just a dandelion. You know, most people would walk right by, but I love when the fog or dew um, highlights those seeds. Another seed. And I'm sorry, I don't know this plant. I would like to know what this plant is. Queen Anne's lace is another favorite. And um, in the center, I'll see if I can turn on this little laser pointer. In the center here, I didn't realize I had a little spider friend. I'm trying to circle it down here uh, for you in the bottom here. I didn't know about the spider friend until after um, zooming in on this photo. Another Queen Anne's lace, very elegant. Love, I love it in all seasons. Time for some fall pollen. And again, the milkweed, just a favorite theme photo. So if you're, unfortunately, if you're watching this on a phone, you might not see the details as well and you can go back to the recording hopefully and watch it maybe on a bigger screen on a desktop. But this is a milkweed stem covered in aphids and this beetle is having an absolute buffet. And I think this poor caterpillar already ate the entire buffet. So just for example, when I take a picture like this, sometimes it's very difficult to focus on something up close. I'll take five, if I really love the subject, I may take 10 photos of something like that to make sure I, I get it in focus that I want. So now I'm looking at, um, this is a hydrangea and first frost is a special, special time of year for me. What I love about it is the plants still have their color, uh, but they get that sugary coating. This is a hydrangea that was just in Rockport Village. Um, I had the privilege of going for a walk that morning and, and capturing. I just find it so elegant. And then I was in Vermont um, at my sister's house for first frost over there this year. And it was exciting to go out in her garden. I didn't even know what was in her garden. And um, these zinnias just looked like they had just been dipped in egg wash and, and coated with sugar candy. And there's her purple tail showing off its beauty in first frost. This was in October. They might've had a slight frost there, but this was a first heavy frost. And then this sweet little bee I found sleeping in a zinnia. And uh, I love bees. We'll, we'll go through a lot of bee photos in a bit. Um, the bee subsequently slept on the bottom of that flower the next day. Um, it was fine. It, once it warmed up, it was feeding again, but it slept underneath the next day. More fall, this is back here in Maine. I have several fields full of milkweed at my house. This, um, Here's a milkweed seed and a monarch, a poor monarch covered in frost. And I sort of likened this slide to uh, the pandemic where we're all just kind of hanging on, waiting for better, better days ahead. Some aster seeds. So 
So I got into photography when I was a time in my life where things weren't going so well. I was struggling a little bit and just getting out in nature and finding the beauty in every day. It was sort of a challenge. Like, what am I going to find that's beautiful today? You know, this is just a weed in the back of the fairgrounds in Union, you know, I'm walking my dogs, but the light was just nice for capturing the seeds and the crazy seeds. Or milkweed. Milkweed in the fall is just fantastic. I don't know if I love it more in the fall or summer. It's, it's a toss up. And sometimes it's just one little droplet of water that just captures and intensifies all that light. Very difficult to focus on um in this style of photography uh, but you'll see a theme i just love the water droplets i love frost frost in puddles i mean this is just a puddle on a dirt road right but um i just find it so incredibly beautiful the artwork that mother nature can pull off for us and i feel so privileged like i, I might have been the only one who got to witness this little puddle that day it, by the time anyone else walked up that trail, it may have melted and was gone, who knows. There's some more puddle art. Uh, sometimes it can be very abstract. These are just two different photos of early ice in puddles and the different patterns they make depending on the wind um, and the conditions. But it's wonderful when you, it, it's such a good feeling when you can just walk by a little puddle and find the beauty in it. The milkweed starting to transition a little more toward winter now, heavy frosts. And several of these milkweed crystal photos. Now we're getting into some snow. So as I mentioned, I take a lot of photos when I find a subject as I'm walking along with the dogs and I you know, want to take a couple different angles. And that's what I suggest is um, you know, tr trying, you see something you want to take a photo of is, is trying the different angles. Um, what's interesting here is you know, I tried one angle. I do love when there's sunlight behind uh, subjects as on the right, it enhances it more. And what you don't realize is as I'm taking these photos, I'm often talking to the dogs and I'm going, wait, 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 don't move, hold on. They're sniffing, trying to do their own thing. And then oftentimes my next photo ends up something like this. So there's a lot of frustrated photos in my, um, in my records as well, but it also makes me laugh because it's, it's challenging photography to do with, with the dogs, but it's part of the fun too. So a few more tips, um, because I'm, like I said, I am not a professional photographer. I actually don't even consider myself a photographer. I feel like a photographer has more of a relationship with their camera. They know how to use their camera and I'm just, fortunate that camera technology helps me frame these pictures. I consider myself more of a framer than a photographer. Um, I, Mother Nature is the artist and I'm just the framer of her or the universe or God's artwork, whatever you want to call it. So here's an example. I get up on a um, early winter morning and there's beautiful snow uh, and here's this apple tree and I want to think about okay how am I going to tell this story so I'll walk you through you know okay if, as you can tell I like to get close up on an image okay well here's an apple from this angle and then I get a little closer do I like it better that way or maybe with the sun on the other side the sun's just starting to come up you can see a few more apples in the background. More apples. Maybe it's just that, maybe that's the story you want to tell. But then the sun starts coming up and that gets me excited because it's going to tell a little bit different story with sunlight on it. And I love that one. A little more powerful with the sun 
hitting the apple and then the dark side of the apple. And then this ended up sort of being one of my favorites from that series was this sugar-coated leaf with all the apple story going on behind it. Um, so, you know, that's one, one thing I like about is um, looking at the story and the beautiful artwork from different angles. And that's what's so neat about nature photography, um, that three-dimensional aspect and, and looking for what's unique or what you love. Oftentimes though, it's my first image that um, is the one I like best, interestingly. This is some Queen Anne's lace in winter, all sugar-coated in the orchard. Again, the crystals captivating that, that sunrise, so pretty. Again, that's Queen Anne's lace. And then just grass. Grass can be incredibly beautiful in all seasons. Uh, not something we think of as, you know, to showcase, uh, but it can be quite lovely. Stacy, we had a question come in from Laura who wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of taking photos specifically in winter's light. Yeah, um, there, a lot of times like today, I probably wouldn't take many photos. Thank you for the question, Laura. I probably wouldn't take many photos um, because the light can be very flat. And just like other times a year, that sort of sunrise, sunset, the low angle, what I love in winter is the low angle light that the shadows can actually become your subject. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, it, you might play around with shooting toward the sun um, with things backlit, uh, but look for the light might enhance your winter photos more is my guess. Again, the crystals, you know, on a gray day, these crystals aren't going to stand out so much. And there's more grass. More apples. So back to pitcher plants. These are some local pitcher plants uh, out on the bogs. When I get out skiing and skating on bogs, I do like to see what they look like in winter. Um, and uh, I... You know what, I forget, I think in the picture itself that I don't think that water inside was as frozen as I thought it would be. Um, maybe it has a little bit of an antifreeze piece to it, but the, the piece on the right there is an old flower from a pitcher plant. These were up on Stevens Pond in, up in Liberty. And then just the simple, you know, here's a, a very flat light photo in winter of this milkweed seed. Still pretty, but maybe with more sunlight on it, it would dazzle a bit more. And ice, ice intensifies the light, just like diamonds, you know, um, I think ice is prettier <laughs> myself. This is just some little bits of um, pond weeds, you know, sticking up out of the water that had some dangling uh, ice beads on it. Just in a little puddle in my yard, some pretty frost, more frost, just getting down. I love getting down low and looking at things up close. But speaking of up close, this is ice, looking through bubbles in ice up close. I think, one of the things that got me into looking at the world up close as a female, when you have to pee in the woods, you get down and you notice things that you wouldn't maybe notice as a man standing up to relieve yourself. Um, and sometimes I get down and I realize, oh, wow, look at this, look at this. I wouldn't have seen this if I hadn't squatted down to take a closer look. Some more ice patterns. These, I believe, were on Magenta Cook Lake a few years ago. This was on Mesa's Pond on a, just a skate with a friend a couple years back. These are some berries inside the ice. It's pretty intense how what the ice, the light and the ice, the bubbles work together. That's on Magenta Cook Lake, a little acorn cap. 
And this is in Northern Maine, um, an early ice skating trip this year. The bubbles um, stack up like pancakes sometimes on early black ice, it's very pretty. This is, I'm gonna take a sip of tea. This is on Tunk Lake. A lot of people skated there last year. Fantastic, that's down east near Sullivan. Beautiful, just chunk of ice reflection. And then I get excited when we have ice storms. A lot of people stress about it. I get excited because I realize that under the right conditions, when I get up the next morning, it's going to look like jewelry out there. And I, you know, get up early and get ready to, to take photos of all the ice on the plants. This is an ice storm um, in Union. And that's just very, very fine grass. But in this particular case, I was fascinated how the ice could build up on such fine little strands of grass. Lots of sparkle. And then the sugar, sugar coating storms too, love those. This is just an example of the same subject, different light, you know, any photography class or school would teach you these sorts of things. Um, you know, just take your subject and look at it at different times of day. Again, back to Laura's question, winter photography, you know, here's something front lit, here's something back lit and the differences in it. Now, this is cool. Um, as I said, I'm not a professional photographer and I hope that you all appreciate and support our professional photographers in the area. We have some fabulous photographers, uh, but I did submit once to the main photo show and it happened to be the year that Peter Ralston was um, judging. And I was so thrilled and honored that he picked this photo of mine to go into that photography show. Uh, this is on the St. George River and in Union um, on a December morning, you know, with a little smoke rising off the river uh, and these beautiful gems along the plants in the river. But interestingly, as I was going back through my photos, I found this photo too, and I forgot I even had it, which is another nice one that I took on that same day. But as you can see, it's, it's, it tells a much different story um, not as much going on, but still pretty intense. More ice. I take a lot of ice photos. I could have filled up a whole hour just on ice photos for all of you. I'm just going to check my time. Oh, we're doing perfect. Here. Now we're going to transition a little into mud season. And I know it's weird to think, yeah, what's nice about mud season other than like some fresh maple syrup perhaps, and looking forward to planting your gardens and starting your seeds. But there is actually a lot of beauty out there in mud season. It's a little harder to find and appreciate perhaps, but the mud puddles often have pretty ice crystals in the mornings. And um, th these I didn't edit much to intensify the ice, which you can do. Uh, but again, this is just dirt road, walking the dogs on a dirt road and some pretty early morning ice crystals um, to just find the, the beauty in, in that sort of time of year. And then of course, we're looking forward to things blooming and some pussy willows, signature spring subject of mine. I, I must have hundreds of pussy willow photos. I don't know what this moss is and I'd love if anyone can offer. I just refer to it as candle moss because um, these, these look like little candles to me, uh, but I love mosses in the spring too. These are pretty. And then the milkweed in the spring, um, it's fallen off its stock. This one lost its seeds, but the silk is so pretty. And I think you're having another talk on milkweed. So I, I hope I'm not overlapping much, but I thought it was so neat to learn that they um, used to use the milkweed seed in making uh, life jackets um, back in the day. And they'd have kids um, go out and collect the milkweed seed during the war to make life jackets. And then the red maples, we all love. They often open up early. A uh, little red maple flower for you. 
I'm promising we're getting to more and more color here coming soon. You spring plants for you. The pussy willows can really look fantastic um, with some uh, morning dew on them. And then the excitement of things coming up out of the ground, starting our season, uh, again, getting down low, seeing what's going on down there near the earth. I'm sure you all, most of you are gardeners. It's so fun to be gardening sometimes and you discover these bugs and friends under the leaves and plants you didn't know were there or fungus you didn't know was there until you got down to check it out. These are elderberry flowers. I'm always fascinated by in the spring and they open pretty early in April usually. Um, and they just look um, so alien to me. Uh, but I appreciate that, that they are one of the early flowers on my property. Um, and of course, remind me of the little shop of horrors, you know, Seymour monster plant. And then the pussy willows start to open more. Trillium, everybody loves trillium and lady slippers. I don't have that many lady slipper photos though. This is hobble bush. Um, it's, I think of it a little bit more as an alpine plant, but I do see it in the Union and Camden Hills area. Uh, it's beautiful flowers in the spring. And here's just a little fern, you know, just a sort of nondescript little puddle. And one of the fern fiddleheads was broken off there. But what I loved was just the swirls around, um, around the stems and leaves. Uh, making cool patterns. So there are beautiful things even in, in the mud season. And then uh, beech leaves, you can just imagine touching that. It almost looks like a, a soft little animal to reach out the softness of those early leaves. Again, backlighting the photo is helping highlight the details of it. Here's a, this was definitely, I was hanging onto the dogs for this photo, right? I had the camera in my right hand, hitting the focus button and the shutter button um, on these blueberry flowers. And the dogs are on my left arm. My left arm's probably quite strong compared to my right arm, <laughs> having them tug all the time. Uh, just sort of a classic, because I have apple trees. I have hundreds of apple blossom photos. I'll give you a little bit of landscape photography because I've spent many walks and over the, all the seasons in the blueberry fields of Maine. And this was one uh, storm where I made the dogs run to the top of the hill with me to capture some photos because the light was so fascinating. I thought we were going to get some rainbows, but uh, the bees were out at the top of the blueberry field that they had just been delivered in the spring. It was just a pretty powerful view. So here's one photo where you have very dark um, light on the subject off to the left. And then the next photo is just similar but different where I'm capturing the rain in the distance there. Um, just going between the two tells a little bit different story. Some bird photography. Again, I'm learning with my, my other camera. I have a... Um, a Sony camera that I've been able to practice with on birds, but birds are very challenging. This is a yellow warbler. Uh, it's actually a banded bird. And I'll talk a bit more about um, some of my volunteer bird work in a moment. Lupins, everybody loves lupins, um, signature flower for photography. So I didn't share with you any of the classic lupin photos that I have. Instead, this is a lupin photo looking down on top of the flower, um, just showing uh, the morning dew on it. Looks like a funny face. And then my yard comes alive with birds in the spring. I'm very fortunate uh, to have a nice variety and I have of birds in our yard and many, many robins nesting here uh, at any time 
in the spring and summer, I look out, it's not uncommon to see 20 or 30 robins in my yard. This mama robin had four, four nesting cycles last summer. She's very busy. I have a nice little shelf for her to nest on though. And here's the little shelf where the babies were. There's uh, four baby robins in that nest. This one is giving me sort of the evil eye, like I'm only gonna wake up if you have a worm for me. Tree swallows, I love those. I have some that nest in my, one of my bluebird boxes. It was fun to try to get pictures of them and the mother feeding them dragonflies last year. And this is a baby warbler that I stressed out about in, uh, after one of those big downpour storms last July when we got like four or five inches of rain overnight. And it was, they, the red starts um, had a nest in my apple tree. And this poor little guy, the nest fell out during the storm, but it made it, um, I helped it back to the tree. It seemed fine uh, and got a, a little picture of it. Such a frail little thing. And I just love being able to see its little toes hanging on there. So now I'm gonna take you out to Matinicus Rock and not that many people get to go there. And my sister and I volunteer every year for Project Puffin in helping babysit the seabirds, um, some of the nesting islands. Like in my background photo here behind me is Pond Island. Um, we usually go to an island in Casco Bay, but one year we got to go to Matinicus Rock which was such a treat. And this is just a beautiful sedum and I loved the lichens on the rock out there. Uh, so wanted to give you a feel for what it looks like out there. And this is another Matinicus rock photo because not many people get to go there. So I figured I'd add a scenery photo for you of, of storm head past um, to our north and east when we were out there, beautiful clouds and you can see off to the right, there are some little structures that are bird blinds and um, all the boulder field where all the puffins and guillemots and razorbills nest, uh, but it's loaded with thousands of birds. What a fabulous place. So when I was out there, I didn't have a decent bird camera. So this is one of my tips for you uh, because these are puffin photos that I took through a spotting scope. Um, the, so if you are a birder and you have a spotting scope and you don't have a zoom camera, it is challenging, but you can hold the camera up to the scope lens and take photos. So I took these photos of puffins. I was in a bird blind and I was lining up my camera, um, my phone, my Samsung phone to get these incredible shots. They're not the highest quality, but they're not too bad from a phone from, I was probably oh, at least 50 yards away when I took this photo. And in the inset down on the lower left is what the, those photos look like before I edit them. So you get the scope um, circle in your photo, uh, but if you take a higher enough resolution, you can then crop out most of that circle later. Uh, but it is one way to cheat if you don't have a fancy zoom camera to get uh, good, good bird photos. And again, this is another one that I took from, oh wow, probably a hundred yards away of a little guillemot on Matinicus rock. And then very lucky, these are some endangered roseate terns, was out on Stratton Island this past summer. Um, so they're probably the most endangered bird that I'll share a photo of today. Very elegant. And we do a lot of work with the common terns and protecting their nesting habit, habitat on the islands we visit. And like I said, I went to visit Pond Island um, in summer of 2019. So it was the first time I got to see the tern chicks. Uh, we usually go out to these islands in May and this was in July, and this is a little, I believe, Arctic tern chick um, pipping out of the egg. You see it's got its little egg tooth there. And then over next to it was its sibling, very camouflaged. That's the, the bottom side of a little tern chick, a little fluff ball. But you can see how they just camouflage right into the sand and they keep their head down until they hear the adult coming in to feed them. 
And then I love the going out to the seabird islands and playing in the tide pools too. So I, I have a lot of tide pool photography. Again, the light at the end of the day. I mean, even a snail can cast a shadow. This is my attempt at urban photography. Many of you might recognize in Rockport Village. This is the corner of Mechanic Street across from the Rockport Library. I don't do a lot of urban photography, but I thought you all might appreciate that's my, my attempt at it with a lovely summer peony. Another urban photography over um, by the Belted Galloway Farm. Again, the water, the dew, the fog. I love foggy mornings for photography. Uh, even just the fog can make a blade of grass or a stick look pretty. Grass with fog on it. <laughs> this, I did enhance this photo a little and boost the contrast of this thistle flower just because there were such tiny little threads of um, uh, like spider webbing down in between the spikes that I was trying to show off those little beads of water too. So you can, you can do some post editing. I often just mostly crop my photos, but there's so many tools out there in post editing, you know, post photo photography editing that you can do all sorts of things. I, I don't like them to look too overly edited though. This is an older photo I have of just a rose absolutely covered in dew. Um, I was just amazed at how much water those rose petals could hold. That's in Rockland. And then just a little dandelion, you know, that you'd walk by a thousand of them in, it, in your yard or field. Um, but if you stop and look, it be, can be quite something with its hanging on to its last little seeds there. Chives. Um, family member gave me these lovely chives from the Camden Farmer's Market a few years ago, and they are a favorite photography subject. Uh, they capture a nice afternoon light in my garden, and uh, many critters like them too, uh, but I'm intrigued with chives, and they're delicious. So if anybody needs some chives, I have some I can split off. <laughs> the bees love them. and the swallowtail. So I hope you're all getting excited for summer now that we're getting more into summer photos. More dandelions, absolutely beautiful seeds on dandelions. I just love them. Each one is so special as it's shedding its seeds at different stages. Here's a little, uh, Ocean front. I think this is over by Stonington doing some kayaking. I added this photo just because I have a focal point on the left here instead of the right, which is different for me, but I was paddling. So I didn't have the dog. So I threw this one in just for that sake. See, and there's some beautiful little pollinators doing their work there. This is on the pond up on Appleton Ridge. Most people would think to take daisy photos from the front, but they were quite stunning with the light on the other side. Little bit more bird photography. Taking photos from a kayak is very challenging. Um, it's, it's one I aspire to do better at, but you're tipping and things are moving. Um, but I did capture this loon roll preening um, on Seven Tree Pond. some more water, fresh water photography. And the lily pads, this was in um, Northern Maine. More lilies. Clover, absolutely love clover. Um, next time it's uh, the clover's in bloom and it's a foggy morning, I highly recommend going out and just looking at, I mean, that's prettier than any diamond necklace I've ever seen in my mind. It can hold so much water. And just all different size beads and droplets. It's a pansy. 
Butter makes everything just a little more special. We get into some bird photography. This is a warbler. Warblers are very challenging to photograph. I think they move every microsecond. Um, so very difficult, uh, but uh, fun to follow them around and see what they do and try to sort of sneak up on them. But it's also fun for me because I can photograph flowers while I'm waiting for them to reappear out of um, the thick brush or woods or, or weeds. This is the red start. I showed you the baby red start earlier. Um, this is actually the male. It has markings that look like a female in this photo. Usually the males are very black and orange. They sort of refer to them as a Halloween bird. But uh, a first year male can actually look like a female and they're usually not successful nesters. However, this one was singing and singing and singing so much. Um, he was successful in uh, the apple tree right off my deck. Baby woodpecker took that picture while holding on to dogs. That was challenging. And I like this one because that flickers are um, notoriously, you see them in the grasses um, and, and feeding in the yard here. But it was the first time I'd gotten a picture of a flicker in a tree. So that was exciting for me. And the bluebirds, now they're great. They're just friendly birds. They're not that timid of humans. Um, they have a nest box near my house and they come and they sit on my porch and just make these classic poses, right? I mean, they're just so stunning and handsome. There's one of the young ones. And so these are very classic photos to me. This one almost looks plastic and fake. Uh, it's got so much shine off its blue, but I actually like some of the more candid ones of the bluebirds that you wouldn't see on a calendar, so to speak, uh, after a heavy rainstorm and they're still out trying to feed. Or last summer when it was super hot, I don't have a bird bath and it was, you know, one of those in the 90s day and I thought, you know, I'm just going to take my Pyrex pie plate and put it out because the birds were literally panting and it it did not take long for the bluebirds to find it. So I, as much as there is the classic photos of the bluebirds, I love these candid ones um, that aren't so perfect, but that bluebird, you can just tell the joy that it, and the relief in it as he's diving into that pie plate. It took a little while for the, the baby female to come over and feel more comfortable there. Um, but then once she got in, she had splashing around good time too. So now we're on to some milkweed. I'm just gonna check my time here. Um, we're getting close. So I'm gonna pick up some speed and fly through milkweed so I can get you to hummingbirds. Milkweed, I just adore the smell of it, all the stages of it, uh, the flowering. It smells like vanilla, heavenly. I love this one because you have the shadow of the beetle on the leaf behind. When you see some flowers like this and you're like, okay, how do I get a good photo of these flowers? You can try different depths, like get one flower in with a blurred background. You can try two different styles. Some more Queen Anne's lace. Pretty in all seasons. This with a really nice dark background really makes the Queen Anne's Lace stand out. And then there's so many friends that milkweed habitat is amazing, as many of you know. So many friends visiting and thriving in the milkweed. I love this little milkweed beetle looking at me and I felt like saying, hey, I love milkweed too. And then the famous part of milkweed are the monarchs. I'm actually not a caterpillar fan. I, they kind of, like some people don't like spiders. Not a huge caterpillar fan, but uh, the monarchs are different. They're special to me. And I love to just go out and see what they're doing. Like this one, I picture the one underneath saying, hey, I'm trying to sleep, don't eat the roof. and see how, what they're chewing on. 
The chrysalis I find it very difficult to get a good photo of. They're so magical. They, they, they're hard to focus on for some reason. So I take a lot of those photos that don't look so great. But this is a very good sign, right? We have a hatched monarch. But then this was not such a good sign. And I had to have a talk with the spider and say, uh, come on, I won't, I won't bother you if you don't bother the monarchs. Here's a common yellow throat. This was fun. I'm just trying to focus on the beads of water. And you can see blurred in the background the little spider whose artwork this belongs to. These are fabulous uh, flower seeds that they go start to seed in July. So I always liken them to snow in July, these little seedy flowers. Sorry, I'm picking up speed here, but I realize we're getting to the hour. So garden time when your zucchinis and cucumbers are out of control, we can all look right now, wouldn't we just adore having one of those out of the garden? So the help I get is from the uh, chipmunks. I just put this photo in because there was just, looks so delicious to be biting into a fresh cherry tomato right now on a January day. I love Swiss chard, the light on Swiss chard. I don't even eat that much of it, but I like how it looks in the garden. And then this is just a cucumber vine um, that I just caught at a certain point, reminded me of a swan. Vines are very cool to capture in photography. This is a dog photo. I'm hanging onto the dogs here on Appleton Ridge, taking a picture of these blueberries. Sunflowers. I'm trying to end you guys with some bright colors. So this one is cropped from the last one see what the detail looks like if you crop it a little tighter. Lots of bees. I love the sleeping bees. There's actually a bee on the back of this echinacea flower. There's a little spider. I love to see where the bees sleep at night. I love there's a bee hidden under one of those flower petals too. I love echinacea in all seasons. And the bees love them, all the pollinators love the echinacea flowers. They get soaked. There's some pollinators sharing their joy. This is a close up of a bee on a sunflower. Lots of pollen. Bee photography is challenging. Sometimes they don't sit still. Snails are easier to photograph. I love hydrangea. Just such an elegant flower. Get close up and see what's going on in the hydrangea. Birds getting a little more toward late summer. The apples are filling out. This is a common yellow throat. And Phoebes are just about the sweetest things ever. They like to nest around houses. So many of you probably have Phoebes and they're such good posers. Just, uh, you just wanna pick them up and kiss them, they're so sweet. So I'm leaving you with some bright colors and we're gonna wrap up with hummingbirds in just a moment. One of my favorite salvias, now we're into the hummingbirds. So to end this off, and I appreciate you all being here. I just have these uh, photos of hummingbirds, my gardens from last summer. Hummingbirds, I have, I do use a camera and set at a, at a high speed so you catch the details of their wings um, because it's hard to get them in focus. But sometimes it's nice to see that, um, that motion in their wings, but you know, but right here it's, it's blurry, but you can tell it's hovering. Um, love the details of their little feet and the different postures they make while they're feeding. 
call this one hosta head. And one of my hosta flowers. And the detail. So I sit on my back deck with my coffee and just click away with photos. It's a great way to start the day. My TV is not on and I'm just enjoying nature. Love the little feathers on the back in that posture. And that's the last one right there. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh my goodness. That was so inspirational. And I, I just checked the weather. And so tomorrow is supposed to be crystal clear, sparkling sunshine. So I hope everyone's inspired to get out there and take some winter photos like the beautiful yeah. you showed us. Um, Should I stop share now? or You can if you up? want. Yeah, you can go ahead and stop share and, and we'll dive right into the questions. Um, uh, if anyone has them. Go ahead and go to gallery. There we go. So um, we have some technical questions that came in. I'm going to just go ahead and start off with uh, Hannah's question. Um, she wanted to know uh, what type of phone do you have? And if you could also uh, mention what type of camera again. I think you mentioned the brain. Sure. More so right now. Sure. Um, thanks, Hannah. So right now I'm using a Samsung Note 20. I have many of those photos for, were from different Samsung phones, which was a, a Galaxy 5 and a Galaxy 7. I actually found for the close-up photos, my oldest Samsung, the Galaxy 5, worked the best. I don't have the best luck on the close-ups on the Note 20. But it's, it's still a great phone. It has a lot of memory for storing photos at high resolution. And then my other camera for the bird photography, I just have to read it here again. It's a Sony RX10. Um, you know, not a, a, a cheap camera, but not, not one that a real photographer would, would probably have. They'd probably invest more in their equipment. And Mary, um, Mary's question, you sort of address a little bit, but maybe you could expand upon it a little bit. She said, um, are the photos you show as taken or have you Photoshopped to blur the background or zoomed in and cropped? And you mentioned it a little bit um, throughout your program that, that you do some. Um, to, to expand upon that, can you talk about, are you doing the majority of your um, editing uh, right on the phone or do you import them into any particular programs? A, a little of both. I I will edit on the phone, just depending if I haven't downloaded them to a laptop yet. Um, otherwise, just the I just use the the Windows editor um, that's on my laptop. I don't use I don't subscribe to any special editing because, I, like I said, I don't like to over edit. Um, and uh, usually, the most that I do is cropping, maybe a little bit of contrasting if it's, it's a little dull and I wanna highlight um, the, the ice or the water droplets, but I try not to feel like I'm over editing. If no, they looked sense. gorgeous. They did not look psychedelic like so. Like so yeah, yeah. When they're over edited, they looked beautiful. Um, so Lynn actually was talking about that she's new to doing photography on smartphones um, and that she gets it when you're talking about taking all those photos to one subject. You know, she does like 10 to try to get the right one. Um, right. She's learned to email herself photos. Uh, she's struggling a little bit with downloading the photos, um, but she wanted to know uh, what is your method for downloading such a mass quantity of photos? Yeah, I so I, I have a drive, a, an external drive to my computer because I have filled up my phones before, I've filled up computers before, um, I filled up my Google Drive. I do back up from my phone to the cloud so that when I am have internet connection, I get a backup without having to physically do anything. So as soon as I come in from outside and my phone connects to Wi-Fi, it starts backing up to my Google Photos account. So that's sort of nice. You feel like, okay, if I don't have time to get to backing up these photos right away, um, they're at least kind of somewhere and I might not lose that favorite one I think I got. Uh, however, I do go to the trouble of manually backing up to an external drive that has 
I, I'm sorry, I don't have the number of how much, how much memory space it has, but it's like the memory space of a, of a couple of my laptops that mm. I can just put really high resolution photos in and videos and not even think about it, worrying about filling it up for some time. And Lynn and anyone else out there, if you have um, any difficulty uh, with, with downloading your photos from a camera to um, a laptop or, or a desktop computer, the Camden Public Library has tech help. So you can give them a call. Wyatt and Henry are awesome and they know how to do all that stuff and they can make an appointment to kind of step by step walk you through how to do it for your specific phone. So uh, we can That's cool. We can help you with that <laughs> because it can be nice for sure. Um, also, uh, Dee had asked earlier, um, you know, I, she originally asked the question when we saw that sandpiper picture, when you started bringing up some bird images and, yeah. uh, and you put up also a, a beautiful image of some fox. Can you talk about with what we saw, um, how often are those photos, how, how close are you when you're taking those photos? And <laughs> percentage of these photos would you say you did with that scope that that cheat trick you told us about uh, yeah that's right so those photos in Newfoundland of the sandpiper and the fox I was actually those types of sanderlings are not that timid and that you're walking down the beach they'll they'll come pretty close so I was maybe within 30 feet of that sandpiper and believe it or not, the same for the fox. We were up a very remote dirt road in uh, northern Newfoundland and pulled over to just look at the view. And these fox, I don't know that they see humans that often. And they came in to investigate. They weren't even afraid of the dogs losing their minds barking in the car. So I was probably within uh, 30 feet of those fox as well. Wow, that's awesome. Um yeah. Yeah, it's just so I, I've done the trick before with the my I don't have a proper scope, but I do have binoculars and I've I've held my iPhone up to it trying to do it. And, you know, it's better than nothing, but I'm inspired by what you showed us to, you know, possibly invest in something a little better with the scope because that that was cool. Very cool. Um, I'm taking a look through some of these other questions and a lot of them have to do with with cropping. Um, OK. And working close up. And I, again, I think you answered quite a majority of these uh, already in, in some of your- That's good. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of tutorials online, but I was just trying to approach it from some other average person without fancy equipment. And so I, I appreciate that you all get out there and capture things too. Um, it's fun. It's a real gift. Laura has a quick organizational question. Um, again, when dealing with just such vast quantities of, of pictures, um, do you have a method for cataloging them? By a, do you, like, how do you find stuff that you're looking for? Do you do it by date, location? Yeah, I, I think in Google, in the Google Drive, I could hashtag them and, and be able to sort them and search for them. Uh, it's interesting when you put a search in your Google Drive, what it pulls out for you. However, on my um, external drive, like my major backup, I just organize them by year mostly. Occasionally I'll pull out an album that is, you know, um, specific to, you know, Newfoundland trip 2018 or, you know, Matinicus Rock 2019, you know, something like that. But it's usually just by year. Believe it or not. So go, putting together this slideshow, I went back through many years um, and it was fun. I'm glad it was fun for us too, for sure. Uh, Jane wanted you to, if you could just mention the type of scope that you used with the puffin photography. Do you? Do you oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, because I was out on the island where um, the, the Audubon Fields crew has equipment. So I did not bring my own personal spotting scope out. So they have pretty decent scopes there, like a Zeiss type scope because they are trying to read the bands on birds sitting in bird blinds for hours and hours. Um, so it was, I would say it's probably a, an above average scope, 
Um, sorry, I don't have more specifics on that. That's okay. Everyone just has to come to our next Audubon talk. We do those. That's right, right. And we can we can bug the presenters for some tips on good stuff. Yeah, they'll they'll know what kind of scopes they use. They'll have great recommendations. Yeah, uh, Jeffrey wanted just to mention that you can buy uh, external drives. Um, and again, I, he's made some abbreviations, and I apologize because I'm not much of a techie. It says my one T W D passport external drives can be had for as little as $50. So if people are looking for storage, it's it's not as expensive as, as one might think for um, just- a... I, also, I also want to add, Julia, when we're talking about the scopes, and I haven't seen them myself, but somebody mentioned that there's an adapter you can get now to put a phone up to a scope, because when you do it, getting the lenses sort of parallel was a challenge. So I was constantly yeah. doing this with the phone, trying to get it to look clear. Um, so I think there are cheap adapters on that now. Hmm. I'm going to be looking into that because yeah. it's very, it makes all the difference. Very cool. Right. Well, that looks like all the questions we have for the most part. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and invite Deborah to uh, come back on so she can talk a little bit more about what's coming up next week. Yes, thanks, Julia. And thanks, Stacey. It was a really great presentation. So next week, February 1st, next Tuesday, uh, the topic is foraging, my favorite wild edibles. And Tom Seymour will be giving that presentation. Uh, some of you may know him from his uh, a garden column that he's had for years in the Courier publications. And he's an author and he has several books out. So um, it looks like it's going to be a really great presentation talking about uh, what are the wild edibles that he finds and where to find them out in the woods. So we hope to see all of you back next week. And if you want to see more about that or any of the other programs that we're having, you can go to our website, which is camdengardenclub.org, go to the events page, and each of those will have a specific item on the different topics and you will be able to uh, press a link that will get you uh, registered for each of those uh, webinars. Thanks. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Deborah, and the Camden Garden Club for organizing all these talks. They are going to be awesome. And if anyone is curious about any of the other upcoming talks that we're doing with Camden Public Library, as I mentioned, we do Audubon, we do Coastal Mountains Land Trust, we do a lot of stuff for, for the nature lovers out there. You can visit us at librarycamden.org and find registration links there. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the snowy, chilly weather today. Make yourself a big cup of tea, bundle up, get a good book, uh, and we hope to see you next Tuesday. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.